So hi, Susan. I'm so delighted that you're joining me today. Um, you are from Beyond the Numbers. We were just joking about your surname and um, the fact that no one can ever pronounce it. And I was kind of go, ni, and then stop. And you just told me it's ni, you've got to remember ni, and creodon. Is that right? It's a ni creodon. Yeah, perfect. Susan, ni creodon. And actually, in, in, in English, my surname is Creedon. Ah. But, but I went to a school where we spoke through Gaelic, through Irish, always. And so I was always knee creodon. Yeah. On the roll, you know, at school and everything. And I kept it. Yeah. Which I think is great. But it's one of those things that's really interesting. When I've spoken to, you know, lots of people know you, lots of people talk very highly of you, know, you know, it's your name comes up a lot in conversation, but it's always your first name. Because <laughs> people are like, I can't pronounce the second bit. And it's almost this is like em embarrassed barrier to engaging because I can't pronounce it. Um, so yeah, so that's so we've got that out of the way. People now know how to say your name. <laughs> Plus, it doesn't really matter, does it? Because we never really use full names when we talk about to one another anyway. Exactly. So you, um, I'm so glad we're having this conversation because you are someone who is um, really passionate about, I mean, you're, as your company suggests, numbers and be, but getting beyond the numbers. So your, your support for companies is really about kind of what's going on behind the scenes. Um, and that's what I quite like because you're quite unique in that sense, I think. I haven't met other people who are doing it quite the way you are, which is why I want to ask you lots of questions today about what you do in the sense of how the, the difference you make for companies. Um, so, you know, I've got lots of questions here. Um, and so I'm going to just kick off and just see how this, how this goes. So when things go seriously wrong in an organisation and the boards and executive committees um, tend to focus on the organization's viability and looking at their operational resilience um, and financial well-being and of course their reputation so how do you do that like what's how do you approach that with the with a company how do people do that so I guess you know it's every company is going to be different mm. but at the end of the day we all kind of come down back to basics don't we we have people in the company who are doing work yes. who are probably bringing in money and who need to be paid yes. and then there are services that need to be paid for and there are products or services that yes. are pushed out and people yes. buy. yeah and and it's kind of like a, a jumble I guess like that but you can really break it down to basics and I think very often when things go wrong, because we might panic a bit, mm. we think it needs to be complicated. Mm. And actually, it's really important to strip away the oomph and bump yes. and the jargon yes. and get back to basics. Yeah. And be very clear and concise in what you're looking at and make it simple and you know, any of us who have trained professionally in something or other, like yourself, Lisa, or myself in accounting, you know, we, we kind of grow up with this technical jargon. Mm -hmm. And actually, the real power is being able to help others understand what you're talking about without ever using that language. Mm -hmm. So they don't feel stupid. Yes. Or they don't feel they can't ask the, yeah, what, like, seem like an obvious question, but it's one that can keep people up at night. Yes, I love that. It's, it's like, it's really stripping it back, isn't it? And I think, you know, with with the work you do, it's a bit like my work, people have these, instantly kind of put up these barriers to kind of understanding what it is they need to get to grips with and having these preconceptions which are completely wrong. And when, and I think, which is why I like, I love chatting with you because you're so down to earth. You're so, you know, I've got a kind of saying with another colleague I work with, it's about keeping it real. And it's so, it's so much about, let's just have a really frank, open conversation and talk about what's really bugging us. Exactly. Yeah. And I think when it comes to numbers, often there are real fears for people. Yes. <laughs> Actually, there's like, there's a thing that's maths anxiety is real yeah. and it's a debilitating. Yeah. You know, people freeze when it comes to numbers. Mm. And I, I think also the language of accountancy and, and finance mm. is mm. kind of devoid of emotion and it makes it more uh, something that's over there. I mean, yes. you know, if you say tax man in the street, you probably get most people kind of cowering and running for the hills. <laughs> they apologise for their role. <laughs> so 
and, but, with all that, but with all that swirling around, like there is so much going on in an organization, how do they know where to focus? So I guess, I mean, the first thing always I think of is let's look ahead for the next few months and see if we have enough cash mm. to pay our bills. And this is, this, people often kind of misunderstand the, the cash and profitability because mm. you can be profitable, mm. but you might not have any cash in the bank. And the profit is, you know, the cash may be owed yeah. by supply, yeah. by debtors to you, somebody you've sold your services to, or it can be tied up in your assets. You might have investments that you can't liquidate, you know, for another 12 months or whatever it might be. Yeah. And actually, the thing that you need to be most careful of is can you pay payroll? And that's, I guess, a real issue, like with the pandemic, that must have made that, like, re brought to the forefront that particular issue. Exactly. And payroll is, like, so important for so many reasons mm. because you know, well, your staff have done the work and so they're entitled to be paid, but also they're going to start looking elsewhere if you're not treating them properly. Mm. And actually it's, it's a cost that you know happens every single month as well. It's not an uncertain cost. It's not one that you're not aware of. And so if you can't meet that, then chances are you're not going to meet a whole lot of other things that need your attention as well. Mm. And I remember like the financial crisis back in 2008, I think brought finance really to the forefront in a lot of organizations, because at that time, you know, a lot of companies really suffered with, with managing that whole cash and profitability. And even myself, I remember I was a finance director in a large international organization at the time. And our payroll was 500,000 pounds a month. So half a million pounds a month. Wow. And we had a bank overdraft facility that was about the same. But there was one week in October, and I mean, I will never forget it as long as I live, because we had £30,000 in the bank. Now, we were owed money left, right and centre. So, you know, on paper, we looked fine. Yeah. But the bank... Yeah. And that whole week, I... I mean, I didn't sleep. I don't think I slept at all that week. Now, the crazy thing was, it was an international charity, like our non-profit organization. We actually received a legacy of a million pounds. <laughs> oh, wow. About three days before payroll or two days before payroll. So we managed the payroll. We also had the overdraft, but I was so afraid to go into an overdraft of half a million that would have wiped out yeah. that overdraft. But the thing I learned most of all, Lisa, was I carried most of that myself. Mm. I didn't involve other people. I felt it was my responsibility. And after that happened, I realized I can't do this alone. Mm. So if you're working with a finance team, make sure if you're in charge of the organization that mm. you're checking in with them how things really are. Having these really difficult conversations almost about well, can we pay payroll? It might seem like a simple thing, but mm. do you know the stress that's behind it for others? Mm -hmm. And also if you're the finance person, share the load. Yeah. You know, don't keep it to yourself. And I think that's where the executive team or the senior leadership in an organization need to work together. And often it's a very lonely role to be in charge of an organization or to have one of those executive roles don't need to be like lonely share it amongst the other directors because they have shared responsibilities i think it's really interesting isn't it because i talk about a lot about that when i'm working with organizations around culture and i think as you're kind of suggesting people are very good at almost assigning people a role like this is your hat so you go off over there and you do that and this person's over here and you've almost ticked the boxes that everything's been covered and accounted for but there's no kind of joined upness and there's no checking out and it's that bit about you know how it, it might not feel like my direct responsibility but how how is it going for you and what's is anything getting in the way are you worried about anything what help do you need it might not be coming from me the help because I might not have the expertise or the the knowledge or whatever but actually we need to know what's getting in the way 
And also, like, if you're in finance, you usually have no control over the sales that are happening. Exactly. Yeah. Or the, the money coming in, even, you know, because that's dependent. The timeline is not your responsibility. Yeah. So I think it's, it's about the senior management sharing amongst themselves. And then I guess the other thing to look out for often as well, then, Lisa, is, you know, in the next 12 months, can we stay in business? Mm. And that, I think that's quite a kind of frank conversation to have. And it's really important to be realistic mm. because once the auditors come in, that's what they will look at and they will examine whether or not they think you have enough financial viability to keep going for 12 months and to trade profitability, profitably. And do you think people are asking that themselves that question or do you think they're kind of burying their heads in the sand and particularly with everything that's happened for the last year and just kind of hoping for the best? Are people having the conversations? Isn't it always a mixture? Mm. You know, it, it, I think looking at finances, looking at those, anything, we always, some people love it and will go straight for it and really have those conversations and make sure they understand all the drivers that are, the cost drivers, but also the income drivers and other people will bury their head in the sand and go, oh, Jesus, I hope this all works out. Um, yeah. And and we like to hide things, too. We like to maybe. Overestimate how we're doing yeah. rather than deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. Is that a good thing? <laughs> yeah. So when you're so if you're then working with companies and helping them think about their performance what are some of the key questions you might be helping them think about so what yeah what, what would be those key questions that would help them to kind of get on track and and really kind of get down to business of what's going on well I suppose you know understanding the numbers is one thing and being financially or numerically literate but actually if you don't really know what's going on behind the numbers then you know it's you're only learning half the story and I think if you take the word accounting accounting means to give account of something yes to give account of something means to tell a story about something yeah. and I always think the numbers are just one half of the story the words and the numbers together tell the full story and it's almost like you know your left and right hand you can't have one without the other mm. And it's very important, I think, for everyone to share and understand what's going on in the business. But basic stuff is kind of like, you know, can we continue to operate at full capacity? And a lot of companies will have made this decision and that's why they've put people out to furlough. But are you putting the right people out to furlough? And have you put too much pressure on the people that you've kept in the business to kind of cover the workload of everyone else? And how are you managing their stress levels? Mm. Um, That's a really good point. That's a massively good point because there's, I think, that for, who do you furlough and who, and how do the people who are being furloughed feel about kind of being furloughed? But then how do the people back at work feel about inevitably their increased workloads? And, you know, if they were, they were working, you would hope hard, you know, fulfilling their role beforehand, if they suddenly got more dumped on their plate, um, you know, I've, I've talked to lots of companies who have that sense of resentment. There's a you know real sense of this isn't fair. And not only, you know, you got that on top of the bur the aspect of burnout and just the fact you can't carry on going. And then you suddenly have these people who are not furloughed on sick leave and, and all sorts of things happen. You just think it's, yes, yeah, so that's a really good point. So I'm assuming you might help people have those conversations around how do you decide who to furlough? Um, yeah, kind of looking, breaking it down like that. Yeah, and... I suppose it's also thinking longer term about well, what are the impacts for the business and do we need to go beyond furlough? Mm, yes. you know, I also think about that because maybe it's better to let some people go yeah. so that they can also get on with their lives. And maybe you need to cut the cloth to kind of, you know, to fit the mm -hmm. situation you're in now. Particularly almost when there's that sense of because people you know like you were saying about brain arousal and so on uncertainty is horrible like our brains just don't cope with it very well and when you have that 
you know, I always, I always say to people, bad news is better than no news. So actually, if you think there's stuff kind of looming, but you're just not facing it, actually face it, deal with it. People then know where they stand and get on. Like you said, they can get on and plan their lives and get on and work out what's next rather than this. It doesn't feel quite right, but no one's talking about it. So I don't quite know. And yeah. You know, it's always a balancing act, isn't it? Between yeah. um, transparency and communicating, but also I suppose a bit of opaqueness is important as well. Because yeah. yeah. you can't kind of open the books and let everyone take a look. Yeah. But but you need to communicate and probably over communicate. Mm. You know, and check in that people really understand what it is you're telling them when you're going to talk to them again and make sure that you uh, live up to that promise as well. So I think it's very much saying, you know, it's kind of like when you write a paper, they tell you, say what you're going to say, say it and say what you've said. It's almost like that as well. And then do that over and over and over again. Mm. And even make a set date to say on the first Tuesday of every month, we're going to have, you know, a company wide call where we discuss what's happening. I think yes. you just want to be kept informed. That communication, I know that communication piece and the kind of clarity bits that you're really, is really important to you. And it's something that kind of underpins so much of what I do with companies. It's the bit that they, companies often think they're doing well, they're not, or they just don't know how to do it well. And it's that sense of monthly meetings. And, and at this month, you know, we're kind of giving you information, but we're actually hearing what your questions are, hearing what your worries are. And it's almost that like two-way communication, isn't it, that has to happen. Um, but it's, it's such an important part that's actually relatively easy to achieve, like calling, having a monthly meeting. You know, that's not a big deal, is it? But it's it's that sense of um, companies just aren't think they're not thinking at that level. They're so bogged down in the detail that is these, you said right at the start, it's about taking a step back and taking it back to basics, going, who needs to know what right now? What do we need to know? Yeah, and also you kind of want to feel as an employee that the people who are leading the business are taking responsibility for you as well, but they haven't forgotten about you. Yes, yeah, exactly. And, you know, we're never, we always complain, don't we? We, you know, it's kind of human nature to go, oh, Jesus, I could do a better job myself and whatever. Yeah. But there's no playbook for this either. Mm. There are no rules kind of, you know, about what have to be, the way you have to do it. Mm. You know, we never went through a situation like this before. So everybody is feeling their way in the dark, so to speak. Mm. And I think, you know, we underestimate maybe the stress that people go under to make decisions, but actually watching them not make decisions is way more stressful and painful for everybody involved. Yeah. So it's also, if you're in charge, it's, it's making decisions and taking action. And that takes a lot of courage when it's uncertain, but then we're never certain of the outcome of a decision we make anyway. Exactly. Exactly. I, I think that's a really good point. Actually, the only thing you can be certain of is uncertainty. It's like, <laughs> you, can't, you don't know the outcome of anything for, for sure. So how do you, I know you, when you ask questions and you have people think about answering questions, you'll tend to break them down into helping them think about operational resilience and financial well-being and reputation. So are there sort of different questions that you might be helping a company address depending on where they're at? Or do you cover all the areas regardless, because actually you need that holistic approach to thinking up kind of financial well-being and their financial status? Well, I suppose I'm always more focused on beyond the numbers and actually really how the people are interacting with each other. Mm. Because often what you find, I think, is there are tensions in companies and there's then miscommunication. So it often comes down to are the relationships really working well? Mm. And, you know, I often think is finance is a bit like electricity. Yeah. (laughs) We take it for granted. It's there. We kind of need it to do most of the things we do. But yeah. when something breaks down, yeah, <laughs> then we really notice it's not working. Yes, I can relate to. It. We had a power cut this week for the first time in ages. I was like, "What's going on?" <laughs> yeah, and you don't know what to do. And yeah. so, you know, you can be in a company that's like that all the time, where you have just no one is ever really. Everybody's in the dark and making decisions in the dark. Yeah. 
or you have an, a company where electricity is running smoothly and everybody's getting on <laughs> with their decisions and, and so on. So I think it's very important for, you know, finance people often have a, a bad reputation. Uh, Monty Python didn't help uh, <laughs> with how they portrayed accountants. But, you know, at the end of the day, people are just people mm. and relationships are the key to getting work done. Yeah. And that is where I always like to start is where are the tensions in the relationship now? Are they in the finance team or are they amongst teams? And we, we can speak at cross purposes very easily mm. without realizing that we're both saying the same thing. <laughs> yes, exactly. And it's, there's so much emotion going on in those situations that sometimes kind of, the boards, the exec don't want to, they almost don't, they don't want to put the emotional side on the table. They don't want to acknowledge that bit. But as you said earlier, people get paralyzed by fear and particularly with everything going on, particularly around the pandemic and so on, it's, it's people are just terrified now of actually look, kind of looking at what's going on in their company because of the uncertainty and what they might find. So how do you help people kind of address the emotional side of it and actually not be afraid of that so kind of looking as you say beyond the numbers so how, how do you help them do that so most of the time I think you know we we, we just carry stories in our head don't we mm, yeah my boss doesn't want to listen to me oh no matter what I say he's not going to listen or she's not going to listen they don't get the numbers they do this on purpose. This is the kind of stuff you, you hear. And I think no matter what organization you go into, people will be kind of clustered in silos or yeah. so on. So it's kind of finding the, the, the common ground. You know, what, what's this business here to do? Well, we're all here to do X. And how are we all working together towards that? And I think you also can have a tendency in a business to think of budgets, for example, as a win-lose situation. Mm. So when you were doing the budget, I need to fight for my corner and therefore yes. somebody else needs to lose out. And yeah, so the glass is up. Yeah. When actually, no, a budget is meant to be the plan for what the business wants to yeah. do in the next 12 months or two years or three months or whatever. And working that out together makes most sense. So sometimes it's a bit of banging heads, but it's also an exercise in empathy because yeah. it's never the first answer someone gives. You know, why don't you talk to finance? Oh, well, you know, they, they have no time for me. Yes. Okay. So what, what is it do you think that they have no time for? And you kind of keep digging until you often get to the root cause, which might be, Actually, I, I, I just break out into sweat when I see a financial report. Mm. Or I lost my last bunch of receipts and I'm afraid to go to finance. Yeah, it can be the most, it can be the most ridiculous things, can't it? But our imagination, which is our, like, our most misused resource in our brain, will take something really small like that. And then if you let that grow and grow and grow over however long you've worked at a company, it suddenly becomes so enormous. You can't often remember the, the original trigger for it. But suddenly there's this feared kind of department and there's this, there is that tension, isn't there, between the different departments and it's trying to get them to work together. And, and also, I think, you know, we were when we went through our training, we're often trained to be quite sceptical, yeah. <laughs> which can, you know, arouse suspicion then with others. But and, and, you know, no seems to be a favourite word of ours and so on. But at the end of the day, we're just people as well. We're trying to do the job in the right way, you know, if you're working in a finance department. And I think it's finding common language so that you can relate to one another. And that would be different. Some people like things visually. Yeah. Some people like just to talk like we're doing now. Others like to read, mm -hmm. you know, or see graphs, whatever. And... I think it, the onus is on both people to find a common way of talking. Yes, um, yes. Because I think your whole, like, you know, using the words you just said about suspicion and so on, kind of what, you know, the no and so on, they, those are not terms that really lend themselves to empathy and building good relationships, are they? And actually, if that's kind of people's, 
starting point and you've got everyone in their own kind of corner defending their corner fighting for their bit kind of with their own stories using you know that language and being very suspicious you can see all these massive walls go up so it's about breaking those down to reduce the tension yeah together more and also I suppose understanding then that there are there are rules so there are ethical guidelines and you know, there was a survey done among public sector finance professionals in 2018, and 50% of those people reported that their bosses or leaders had, you know, attempted to get them to do something that was um, against their own ethics, take action that was, you know, unethical. And a third of those 50% actually did, took that action. Mm. And that weighs very heavily on people. It will mm. weigh very, very heavily on people. And I guess you'll find, you know, that's why we have whistleblowing and all of that kind of side of things. And so I do think when finance people are very adamant about no, yes, it's also important to understand what's behind that. And there are rules and legal guidelines that have to be adhered to so there's a mix yeah and I, and I guess that comes back to that communication bit then doesn't it like so if they are having to say no because they're actually having to adhere to certain guidelines it's about saying no because I'm adhering because that is against what I'm allowed to do rather than no because I don't like you because otherwise the person making the request or trying to communicate ends up kind of putting their own perspective on it which is well they just don't like me mm -hmm. not that person but not for me not realize the intricacies of the you know the difference yeah but also what you can have is you know you can be on a management team where as the finance person you are the lone voice who is saying well actually we really can't take this action you know it's unethical mm. uh, if we get caught whatever and everybody else is look you know no one's ever going to look at that let's just go ahead and I'll put my hand up if we ever get caught and that can be a really difficult situation to be in as well. And very, very lonely. And, yes. you know, and whether you're, maybe you're the, even the managing director or you're the finance person, you need to talk to someone about that. You can't yes. keep that to yourself. And if people aren't listening to you, most of them, the accounting bodies have ethical hotlines. Okay. So you can actually ring someone and have a conversation with them and they will advise you when you need to step away. That's helpful. Does everyone know about that? that I, I, don't know like that. I don't know that actually. Yeah. Gosh, it's interesting. Yeah. And I think, you know, ethics are often a gray area anyway. Yes. And, but I think if you think in terms of if you were a doctor, no one would ask you to break your Hippocratic oath. oath. So why, why would you ask a finance to compromise their ethical guidelines? Exactly. And as you said, it's a gray area, you know, for, for anything in life, if you're not sure, or if you just feel a bit stuck with something, just get someone else's perspective, just can only be helpful. Even if it kind of is the evidence then that actually, yes, I'm right, or actually hadn't seen it that way. Um, so that's kind of about, I guess, the trust, the authentic relationships, that kind of being open, to be able to engage with each other. Are there particular practical strategies that you'd say you know, companies should be thinking about in terms of how to build those relationships? It's the same the world over, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think, um, well, is it Patrick Lencone's uh, Five Dysfunctions of a Team is a great way to read something and actually take practical steps mm. to go okay or is that how we are you know it's get rid of politics yes yes get rid of politics get rid of fake news and rumors don't allow those kinds of things to happen yeah and also show your vulnerability show that you don't have all the answers i think you know when you become a finance director, everybody looks at you going, oh my God, you must be amazing. You must know everything and wow, or whatever, or a managing yeah. director. Or, yeah. And actually you've never done it before. How can you? 
you're you're feeling your way where most of us are feeling our way through our days yes i know the technical side but mm, i don't know everything so it's kind of it's working together it's breaking down barriers mm. eliminating nonsense mm, yeah and and like and and as you said that vulnerability that authenticity that is so key it's so good to hear you say that because i think that's something I talk a lot about that with companies. It's not something people naturally associate with finance, where you've got to, it's almost this illusion, you've got to know everything because this is so important. This is all numbers and clearly you therefore have to know everything. And actually it's really interesting that your, your messages and your, your approach is so similar to mine, but yet it's around something so incredibly different, um, you know, around numbers really really interesting but I think most people if you step back mm. that's that's what's behind how none of us ever really get on with one another or understand what others do is because I often think you know academic or academia is sometimes wasted on yeah academics because they produce so much information that's so helpful but it's very difficult to understand yeah. and to use practically. Yes. And I think it's the same with finance. Finance is so useful and you cannot run a business without it. But unless you can engage with that and, and talk to people and, and feel that it's also something you need to understand. Mm -hmm. And human resources, people are not just for human resources. Yeah. There's people in every single department and every person needs to understand how to relate to other people. Mm -hmm. And we put a lot of emphasis on technology and technical skills and improving them. But you're not gonna get anywhere without people. And it, and it is that bit, isn't it, that we forget like that someone in a position is a human being. So a finance director, suddenly has a lot of responsibility. There's a lot of pressure on them to um, be able to do everything they need to do, but they might not be feeling particularly confident about it, or they might have questions and not know who to go and, you know, who, who do they feel safe enough to say, actually, I don't know the answer, or I'm a bit worried about. And, and actually, is that clear in the company who they can, if there's only one of them, you know, who do they have that conversation with? Well, I think if you can't have that conversation with your line manager, mm. then maybe it's time to look elsewhere. Mm. Yeah. And, I, you know, because you can't keep it to yourself. It will it will weigh on you and it'll ease away at you. Um, and you will suffer. Yes. Yes. You know? And, and it's kind of like you're keeping all these plates spinning, but at some point they're going to start breaking. Mm. Um, so if you can't have it with your line manager, perhaps you can have it with the audit partner mm -hmm. or the audit manager or a peer. I mean, you, you know, you probably trained with other people, you know, or you can get coaching, whatever. You know, there's plenty of people out there. There's plenty of resources. Uh, you know, there's... Um, recruitment agencies that offer kind of you know different ways of approaching finance and you know there's, there's so many resources available to people I think and so many support groups and peer support groups it's easy to to share but don't keep it to yourself yeah so it could be actually about someone who's got responsibility for that if they haven't got a big team around them and they feel like they're on their own it's actually about making sure they have a network they have the support available which might not be from within their own company even to make sure that they can do their job well mm -hmm. yeah okay and and but also do your best to have that relationship with your line manager because that's key and especially if they're the kind of in charge of the whole organization yeah 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 but and, and because they don't really know what they're doing either <laughs> <laughs> and i think as soon as everyone's honest and says we're not really sure what we're doing here. I mean, I've done that, you know, when I'm working with colleagues um, who have their own companies and we kind of get together to do some collaborative work on something and you have that testing time at the start, like, 
is it okay to say I'm rubbish at this or I have no idea about that or what they what does this person mean when they're talking about such such in a meeting or because you feel like I'm kind of I'm, am I going to be laughed at am I going to be frowned at um and I think it's just letting your guard down to it and it and and yeah it goes back to being authentic <laughs> which is what we keep talking about yeah and I suppose you know it does take courage to do that there's no doubt about it yeah but what's the worst that can happen <laughs> exactly exactly because people feel and again it's their imagination saying it's going to be terrible i'm going to be laughed at this is going to happen that's going to happen and you, and you you know if you encourage someone just to try it once with someone they feel quite safe you know the safest scenario and they're like well, that's absolutely fine i survived i can do it again yeah and and i know myself you know certainly when i was younger i wanted to do everything myself and you know show that i could i suppose and yeah. And, and once you open up and actually show that, oh, I'm not really sure what's supposed to happen now, you bring people with you. Yeah. And also you never know where the solution will come from because mm. I think one of the words you used early on that I wanted to drop on is perspective. Mm. It's very easy to get pigeonholed Yes. When you're, especially when you're under stress and pressure, you're not going to hold too many things in your head. No. Or you are not going to be able to see more than your perspective. And you need to have other perspectives. And oftentimes somebody who's not involved at all mm. might say something that triggers, oh, gosh, oh, we could do this or whatever. Yeah. You know, especially when we, we now need to do more with less. Yes. Necessity definitely is the mother of invention. Mm. So bring people together as in whatever form you can mm. and just talk things through. Because I guess also that's really important with, because I always think of finance as being very black and white because it's numbers. So surely it's factual and it's all black and white, but actually there, I'm guessing there's quite a lot of gray in there. Like kind of what are, what are those sort of, gray areas that people need to look out for which I guess means they're going to have to have good conversations because there is no way of looking there's no one factual way of looking at it that's the thing isn't it you can kind of get numbers to do whatever yeah yeah you know creative accounting is that's definitely a thing <laughs> but we you know account accounting operates within guidelines and they're recommended guidelines yeah. and then you have companies law as well yeah. and I think I always think the easiest thing is if everybody has some level of financial literacy and financial understanding rather than pretending they do mm. Because actually when you pretend you know something and you don't know it, then that's what causes issues as well. Yeah. So then you're full of gray areas. Yes. <laughs> because when, when the finance person suggests something, then somebody over there will go, well, why don't we do blah? And you're like, well, well we can't do it like that because, and then somebody goes, oh, but I really love that idea as well. And suddenly they're all off in one direction. <laughs> yes. And that gets all really lonely. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and actually, there are so many resources now as well for people to get a grounding in finance. You know, you can do non-finance for finance or finance for non-finance professionals. Okay. In so many different ways, you know, you can do training with a, another group of people. Uh, there's a guy I know who has a game so he actually has designed a game wow. that keeps you through your um, profit and loss account and balance sheet and helps you understand the assets and liabilities. It's phenomenal. Well, that's the sort of thing that we need, isn't it? To make this something that we can actually engage with without feeling that this, this enormous kind of, this enormous thing that I just can't get, I just don't feel confident enough about where to start. Making it in, like a game, or the, like, you know, you talk about stories and so on, so that you can actually just really feel like it's, it feels safe and fun to be engaging with that. It makes such a difference. And and also, I think trying to just relate it to normal things, like we talk, I talked about finance being like electricity. Yes. But, you know, I always think when 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 you talk to people about contracts and the importance of contracts, you 
it's almost like if you had a mortgage wouldn't you read the mortgage? Yeah. Like every bloody word before you signed the piece of paper. Yeah. So when it comes to work and signing a contract, won't you do the same? Mm-hmm. And, you know, or the supermarket, do you budget when you go shopping? Do you have a household mm-hmm. budget? Mm-hmm. If you can kind of bring stuff back to day-to-day activities, mm-hmm. because really we don't go through life without numbers. Mm-hmm. We can't, you know, our birth date, our phone number, there's so there's exactly. numbers everywhere and uh, they're not that scary they're 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 fun and you can do a lot with them yeah I and I love the fact that where you when you talk about this you talk about it with such a lovely smile on your face and, it's, and you talk about it in such a fun engaging way that I automatically like even just having this conversation breaks down the barriers in my mind to the numbers side of a business because I actually think well yeah it's not such a big scary thing after all it's something I can engage with it's something that I, I need to be, and and the only good stuff can come from that. And I've got people like you, and you know the resources you mentioned today, who can help me on that journey as well. Yeah, is there, anything else, is there anything else that kind of companies should be looking out for? Well, I, again, I I really think keep an eye on the basics. We we love shiny new things we love complicated things we love to think oh this must be really hard but actually it's the basics and I always always try and get people back to basics Mm. can we meet payroll this month next month and the month after do we know what our main drivers are are there any areas that we can you know, maybe suspend the expense. Mm, Don't mm. always cut, but cutting costs isn't always the answer mm. because, you know, you might not necessarily think through the consequences of, of where you cut something. Yeah. So it's, it's really about understanding how every cost you have contributes to your business staying afloat. And, you know, people tend to cut away things like marketing. But if you cut marketing, yeah. then how's your product going to keep up there? Exactly, exactly. So, so who would be the basics? Basics. Sorry, go on. Yeah, it's the basics, really, Lisa. Yeah. Forget the complex. Forget the that it's, it's difficult. It's not. Yeah. It's very, very simple. And get back to basics. So who would be the right people in an organization to be having the conversation with you is it the finance people is it the you know the the leader of the whole organization who is the who would be the right person to be saying actually Susan sounds like someone I need to sit down with and say this is where I'm at this is what I'm struggling with um this is what I'm not doing and I think I should be doing or actually I have no idea what I'm doing um or I just want someone to check that I'm doing the right thing. Because actually there, there's a really great practice around. They just want to make sure that they're kind of doing everything they can do. Who would be the right person? Uh, so, again, it always depends, doesn't it, Lisa? Mm-hmm. I think, you know, if you're a small business, chances are you don't have a big finance team. And you might not have anyone who does strategic finance. So mm-hmm. maybe you need someone as the, 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 as the director to come in and... And just say, look, I don't really know what's going on here. I don't know the questions to be asking. Yeah. This is my gut telling me this, but blah, blah, blah. So, that, you know, that's, but then maybe you're a managing director of a larger company mm-hmm. and or a CEO and you don't really get on with your finance person or you don't understand them and mm-hmm. you would like someone to come in and help mediate between yes. the two. Or you're a finance director who's going, oh my God. Yeah. I can't get my point across. I I either need someone just to confide in, a safe space to kind of, you know, talk about things, maybe build up my own confidence in tackling people, mm. get over imposter syndrome, whatever it might be. Or you might have a finance team that you want to engage better. So you're you're kind of almost you could be the the kind of the key person. Just it's really interesting hearing you speak because it's potentially actually rather than just going and working with one person, you can be working with different people across the company to help them actually gel as one to bring them out of their silos and to improve those relationships and that communication and 
Yeah. And that's exactly what I see myself as. And yeah. it's kind of the person who, you know, I love detail, mm. but I also love people. Mm. And I do both as in kind of equal proportion. Yeah. I'm not interested in, in the finance side of things, as in like, I'm not interested in the technical side of things. Yeah. I'm not having those conversations, but I can help translate yeah. or maybe lessen the fear and the anxiety around yeah. it and bring numbers to life. Yes. So Susan, how are people going to get in touch with you? Like how is it, is it by your website or what's, what's the best way for people to reach out? Well, so you'll find me on LinkedIn. Okay. Uh, Susan Nifriadon, very easy to find because there's only one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then my website is beyond hyphen the numbers.com. Yeah. And I also have a podcast, Lisa, because I guess what really drives me is, you know, having a more fulfilling work life. And a lot of what we've talked about today is the stuff that often impinges that. Mm. And so I have a, a podcast called Life Beyond the Numbers, and I interview people that work in finance about how they might be misconstrued or how they've helped other people understand the numbers. And I also talk to like people like yourself yeah. and, and others who are helping organizations and businesses to be more people centric. Yeah. Cause that's what it comes down to. Yes. Put people first. Yes. Everything else will follow. Exactly. That is a brilliant way to finish. I have so enjoyed talking to you. I, I could talk, I remember the first time we met, I actually remember at the event we were at when we met and I just remember you saying something about numbers and, and, and me thinking, that sounds a bit technical and a bit scary. Um, and actually, you know what, as soon as you started talking, that we have so much in common because it's all about the people. So I've really loved hearing more in more detail about how you actually work and how you can help and how we make this thing more accessible. Um, so thank you so much, Susan. Much appreciated. And um, yeah, Karen having some good conversations with companies. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah.